Namaste and greetings. I, GBAT, researcher at INCRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti, Anusandan Sansan, Nayi Dili, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI hashtag Bear Policy Talks. Today, we are gathered for a special panel discussion on the future of labor force, impact and way forward from employers' perspective. As a part of the state of employment and livelihoods, hashtag employment debate. This series is organized by INPRI, Center for Work and Welfare, Impacted Policy Research Institute, New Delhi, Indian Social Institute, and Counterview. The moderator for today's session is Professor K. R. Shyam Sundar, who is a professor at XLRI, Savior School of Management, Jamshedpur. We welcome you, sir, to the discussion. We are honored to have with us today, joining as panelists, Dr. Rajan Mehrotra, former senior specialist of employers' activities for South Asian region, International Labor Organization. We welcome you, sir. Nandini Sarkar, who is the director and co-founder of SQL Management Services, Kolkata. We welcome you, ma'am. Dr. Pallav Bandyopadhyay, he is the founder of HR Plus, Bangalore. We welcome you, sir. Professor E.M. Rao, the former professor of personal, ma personal management and industrial relations, XLRI Jamshedpur. We welcome you, sir. And Michael Dias, who is a managing partner of Michael Dias and Associates, and he's also the secretary of the Employers Association, Delhi. We welcome you, sir. As a discussant, we are also joined by N.S. Iyer, the founder director of Health Built Lives Mumbai and a visiting faculty at the Tata Institute of Social Science, Mumbai. We welcome you, sir. Now, I invite our moderator, Professor K.R. Shyam Sundar, to initiate the discussion with his opening remarks and proceed with the deliberation. We look forward to learning from our esteemed panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ati. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, the Center for Work and Welfare, IMPRI Impact Policy Research Institute, New Delhi, Indian Social Institute, ISI New Delhi, which is a Jesuit organization. And we have coming from XLRA as I do, we have special bonds with ISI, and of course, counter view. Uh, thanks for organizing this uh, important uh, discussion on the future of labor codes as a part of this series on the state of employment and livelihoods. Uh, have been associated with IMPRI and ISI for some time. And uh, Dr. Rajun Kumar has been consulting me on the organization of some of the themes. I said to him, having worked with the ILO for a decent uh, uh, number of years, I believe that we should have perspectives from various stakeholders. Some three weeks ago, we had the trade union's perspective. And uh, a fortnight or a week ago, we had uh, a, a discussion on the need for employment policy and I advised him that it is uh, very much proper and even imminent to get the perspective from the employer side. And soon we will have the one on the government side. As a moderator, I would like to flag some issues uh, for, uh, with a request to the panelists to try to address them in their uh, conversations and engagements. We all know that a couple of years ago in 2019, the wage code was enacted exactly in August. And last August amidst COVID pandemic, the remaining three codes, the industrial relations code, the social security code and the occupation safety and health and the working conditions code were, all the three were enacted. But we are yet to see the effective implementation of the codes 
either in the central sphere or in the state sphere for various reasons. The Labor Secretary assured the nation that it will be all the codes together will be implemented at, in, at one go. April 1st was the gestation date. Then it was shifted to October 1st. Recently, the Financial Express reported that it may not be October 1st after all. The reasons given are twofold. A, the state governments, several state governments have not uh, framed the rules. I guess I'm, I'm writing an article for the leaflet on the future of the labor courts and I did some homework today and I found that 19 states, including major states like Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, West Bengal, Kerala, have not framed the rules. The second reason is that, according to the newspaper Financial Express, employers have been lobbying with the government that the definition of wages is far too tough on them because the social security outgo would be rather higher. So they want the 50% uh, cutoff to be reduced to maybe 30% and gradually enhance them. On the other hand, the trade unions are steadily protesting against the implementation of the codes and they want the wage code and the social security codes which are beneficial to them to be implemented first and the remaining two codes later. So we are at we are, we are caught, caught up in a legal vacuum or a legislative stalemate. So in this, according to the employers, what is going to be the future of the labor courts? Where are we going to go? So some issues that I would like them to address are, one, what is the strategy? Are they engaging with the central government and the state governments to hasten the process? of implementation of the four labor codes. Secondly, do they have any particular strategy? Do they want the labor codes to be implemented in parts, rather as opposed to the government's view that all four codes at one go or no implementation at all? Is it the right strategy? Any specific comments on any specific codes that they are welcome to respond to? And of course, work from home is a new normal or and the hybrid and various other, other uh, new normals are evolving as the world is uh, trying to uh, uh, grapple with the pandemic. So what will be the perspective on the way work from home, which is limited to the service sector? Do they want it for the manufacturing sector as well? And the Indian Labor Conference the historic tripartite forum has not been convened after 2015. Or the what I mean, what do the employers' body think about it? I know Mr. Michael Dias has been actively engaged in the Indian Labor Conference. What is the thinking on the part of the government and what is the thinking on the part of the employers? And also, it would be very good if we could have some kind of a micro-level assessment of the impact of the labor courts. What will, what, will, what, will, what will it mean at the micro level? So these are the issues that I would uh, flag. And uh, of course, they are free to structure the, their uh, engagement in the way they desire to. Of course, Mr. Endas Iyer is there uh, as a discussant to provide a direct sense of direction. So the plan is like this. We would have each of the panelists to speak 10 to 12 minutes, and uh, then we would have uh, the discussions, uh, remarks, and then the question and answer session if there are any, and then finally the way forward. With these uh, preliminary remarks, now may I invite Dr. Rajan Mehrotra, former senior specialist of employers' activities for South Asian region, ILO, and now is a uh, visiting faculty in some of the IAM Sino definitely is a visiting faculty at IAM Jaipur. So over to you, Dr. Rajan Mehrotra. Thank you very much.
Sir, you have to unmute. Yeah, please unmute yourself. Rajan, sir. Yes. I would first like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak and thank Sham Sundar. You have given a framework and let's try and look at this. The theme of the conference is the future of the labor code and the way forward from an employer's perspective that you mentioned. We must look in terms of what has happened in the past, what's taking in the present, and what's likely to go in the future. I, as a student, recollect that the first National Commission on Labor, headed by the earlier Chief Justice P.B. Gajendra Gadkar, came out with its report in 1969. And I was a student of Bajaj Institute, and I remember purchasing it for 10 rupees and reading it. Let me honestly admit nothing got implemented. When I used to work in the ILO at that time, the second National Commission on Labor was appointed. Mr. Ravin Verma headed it. And in all fairness, he gave his report in 2002. I also recollect that when I looked at the terms of reference between the first and the second, and that time, the terms of reference in the second had permitted the National Commission on Labor to submit an interim report. So I did recollect telling Mr. Ravin Verma that what my experience has been, that these reports normally don't get implemented. And I suggested, why don't you submit an interim report, ask the government to implement, and then submit the final report. But well, I mean, he did not, he in his own wisdom decided because the committee has to decide what they want to do. Though the terms of reference provided it. It is true that a lot of water has flown. There have been discussions. And what you rightly brought out that the parliament did pass. And the reality is that the labor code has been passed by parliament and given the assent by the system. It's a question of notification when it gets implemented, but obviously it has not been implemented because the draft rules on which the comments were obtained by the central government are finalized, but obviously they have not released those as final recommendations in terms of the uh, rules waiting for the state. My own hunch is it will not get implemented on 1st September. 1st October. I also look at it that given what has been happening in the past and the problems that the government has faced, my own interpretation and hunch and this is my perception is that they'll wait till the elections of UP and Punjab are over next year. And after that, all these codes obviously will get implemented. It is for the government in power to decide when it wants to implement them. I mean, employers and trade unions can have their own views, but it is true that at some day, these codes are bound to get implemented. I know there are reservations. You had reference that can we look at it from a micro perspective of what happens. And since I worked in the corporate sector and look at it from an employer's perspective, I would look at how the code impacts and what were the pain points of the labor pain points which the employers used to feel and have they been taken care of or have they been handled. The first, as I see, has been an issue on recognition of trade unions. While the law permitted registration, the law was silent on recognition. And for the first time, the code has really brought this out. Otherwise, the state governments had this. Kerala had a law that permitted how recognition should be done. West Bengal had it. Maharashtra had MRQ, Pulp Act. But yes, this is something that has come about where the employers will have to agree to recognize a union. And there is a bargaining council that will take place if there is multiplicity of 
The second issue which has troubled most employers has been multiplicity of unions and inter-union rivalry. While this to some extent has been addressed in the code that the dispute can be taken up with the industrial tribunal, one has to see how this takes place because let me tell you, these are operating problems at an enterprise level that takes place. And these are hard realities. Some or the other verification of membership. In fact, I recollect Mr. Ravin Verma's report clearly suggested that the checkoff system be implemented in all enterprises that have more than 300 workmen. Now, when I look at a large amount of recommendations that were made by the Second National Commission on Labor, have not necessarily found place in this report. Somewhere the checkoff system and what should be the tenure of recognition, how is it co-terminus with the settlement, are some points that which he beautifully analyzed. I know there are unions that are opposed to the checkoff system. So this is one thing. I also will take up another second point where the allegation has been against employers and the unions have been upset on the cutoff limit that has been placed with reference to layoff, retrenchment, and closure from 100 being taken to 300. I just want to bring out to this audience that if you go back to the Industrial Dispute Act, it was 300. It was during the emergency when Indira Gandhi clamped the emergency that it was brought down to 100. I recollect I used to work in the corporate sector and both strikes and lockouts were banned. The emergency was lifted, but the goalpost was not restored back to 300. Now, unions are totally upset on the 300 number. I just want to bring out that nobody runs a business to close a business. But at the same time, I also want to bring out that Mr. Ravin Verma clearly had suggested that the compensation played in the case of retrenchment and closure cannot be 15 days wage per year of service. And having myself worked in the corporate sector and known how you operate, one has to design voluntary retirement schemes and the compensation paid is much larger. Now, somewhere these did not find, I don't know why in terms of the report, the quote that has come about because Ravin Verma clearly on retrenchment had suggested that 45 days wages be paid for six units and 60 days wages paid for the others. And he said that if the number is less than 100, it should be 50%. Even on closure, he had suggested that as far as NGOs or sick units are concerned, they should pay 30 days, others should pay 45 days. Now, I think that has also been something which the, should have been looked at, but unfortunately is not there. So I'm trying to give another perspective because I also feel that if somebody loses the job, a compensation rightly should be given and cannot be 15 days. I think that's something that has remained. Another one more point I would like to look at, which is with reference to Section 9A notice of change, which was there, and which has been add, copied as it is and put in the code. In fact, Mr. Ravin Verma on item 11 of the Schedule 4 of the Section 9A suggested any increase or decrease. He said, remove the word increase. Nobody drags the management to a court. But you know, it is copied. I technically cannot give employment. Your seminar is in terms of employment. A section 9A notice of change can be attracted. Now, even that has not been done. I'm not, there is item 10 of the schedule, which talks about standardization, rationalization. That's something that the employers wanted. But that's not been taken up because let's be clear, any enterprise to survive in business will have to upgrade the process and technology. You can yourself see that today you are doing a webinar, which is in terms of online and not the traditional method. Now, if you do bring about a change, and I have faced a lot of litigation in my life from the union, item 10 of Schedule 4 had to be removed or re-looked at. Now, none of this has happened. So these are the types of worries. I'll only cover one more point and then stop because there are other speakers. There's something called the gig economy and the gig worker. And in the new code, 
they have very clearly mentioned that it does not have an employer employee relationship i clearly see that the platform type of business that people are doing and the gig worker is a fuzzy employer employee relationship and this is going to get highly litigated while in the social court they have tried to look at it for the benefits that can be given to them and have left to 1 and 2% and those types of things i just want to end by saying that the french court of cassation in march 20 gave a verdict to look in terms of what is gig workers and they said that the employer employee relationship would not hold if the business partner should manage the client the business partner should be able to sell settle the price and the business partner has the choice to exercise the task that he undertakes now my own hunch is some of this will get litigated with this i'll just briefly stop because i think 10 minutes are over and leave it to the other panel so i just thought i'll briefly cover up something that i look at uh, dr uh, merotra i just want to ask you a couple of questions which you can probably throw light on is you know we talk about a bargain in 51% and above when if there are no then you have a negotiating council etc how do we address this issue as far as where there are no unions at all in an organization point number 1 point number 2 is that if you have any understanding on wages etc with a larger employees or something which are employee representatives and not union and thereafter if a union comes how do you manage this would would it not lead to more litigation point number 1 one question uh the second the second question is about um, you know uh has the security of the unions as the insecurity of the unions at all be addressed when we move from 100 to 300 have the unions be consulted and hence a larger question of what is going to happen as and when these are really coming up for implementation at a micro level at the shop level uh thank you mr ayer um, um we will have the uh, panelists to answer the questions at the end uh, because the flow of the panel discussion needs to go on uh so i mean i'm i'm thankful to uh mr mehrotra for uh, putting the entire uh, issue of the labor code and labor law reform in an historical perspective the 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 main point that comes out to uh, two main points come out very clearly one is the political economy of labor law reforms to him the the course may not be implemented or shall not will not be implemented till the uh, some important state assembly elections uh, such as uh, up and punjab would be over that is possible and secondly he pointed out uh, by giving examples of a huge uh, disconnect disjoint between ravi verma second national commission on labor and the ir code that has been stitched together in fact the entire legitimacy of the labor codes hinge on the codification recommendation given by uh, the second national commission on labor thank you very much uh, sir and you may also uh, when you when you come again uh, uh, respond to the queries uh, raised by mr raiyer and of course you raised about the gig economy and i am sure we have amidst us uh, ms nandini sarkar um who, who i mean uh, who's uh, i mean who has worked very much on the social security code and i'm aware of her, the kind of work that she has done and her organization has done so probably she will be able to say a bit more on the gig and the issues that uh, that are uh, related to or clouding the gig economy over to you ms nandini sarkar thank you very much Ma'am, please unmute yourself. Nandini, ma'am. Sorry. 
Yes. So, uh, very good evening to the distinguished panel and to the distinguished audience from, I believe, HR industry and academia. Uh, Professor Sundar, I'm glad you permitted a counter view because our view from SQL is going to be a complete counter view to what you know we are reading in the media uh, and to you know a, a certain part of the views expressed by Mr. Mehavitra. My company, SQL, uh, handles labor law compliance and social security employee benefits implementation for the uh, direct employees of principal employers, as well as for contract labor all across the country. We work across 90 cities. So my, my view or our view is a counter view uh, based on a silent revolution that the government, both at the center and at the states, has already brought into play right from 2014 till date. I, I'll cite two examples in defense of what I'm saying. So, uh, you know, contrary to the belief that because the Social Security Code, for instance, is yet to commence, the Labor Secretary has gone back on his word. Uh, you know, uh, silently using the EPFO as its vehicle, in January 2021, the EPFO mandated that all principal employers shall upload the monthly attendance, salary, and PF contribution of all its contractors, permanent and casual, on its own UN portal. So on the one hand, you know, whether it's a social security code or the OSH code, it has eased business by legitimizing the use of contract labor in this country for the first time. You know, contract labor was a dirty word in this country, manpower supply even more so, and uh, industries, you know, are used to covering up the engagement of contract labor through a 24 to, through a 240 days contract sham. Now, what the labor codes are suggesting is uh, there's a new definition of contract labor. And there are two things, you know, which uh, are very, very noteworthy. For the first time in India, in the history of India labor law, contract labor, including manpower supply, is legitimate, provided. The contract labor has social security benefits, and each of them is issued an appointment letter. Number two, very significantly, Professor uh, Sundar, uh, the court goes on to say that the regular workers of contract labor shall not be treated as contract labor. It further eases business by saying that manpower suppliers and contractors having a pan-India presence will be allowed a one India, one registration, rather than take registrations across states. But all of this is being balanced, and very rightly so, by putting certain obligations for compliance on the principal employer. Now, working very closely with industry uh, for the last 21 years, and seeing the major deployment of contract labor, what has bothered us very much is, you know, uh, at, at, at various levels, the sheer exploitation of contract labor. So if you have a direct employee and a contract employee doing the same work, why should you not as the principal employer and under your company's own philosophy of corporate social responsibility, ensure that the contract worker gets minimum wages, gets paid his salary, not in cash, but through a bank transfer by the seventh of the month, and most importantly, gets medical benefits and gets provident fund. That's a, you know, that's a basic human right. Now, what the government of India and the Ministry of Labor have been stating for years, which nobody has been listening to, because you know, uh, we don't read between the lines, we don't connect the laws, we don't connect the dots. Anybody who wants to have a correct understanding of the spirit of India labor law, must understand that the government is seeking partnership from corporates in implementing compliance at the grassroots level, which is contractors. So coming back to this recent missive from the Employees Provident Fund organization, Professor Sundar, uh, the EPFO, I must inform you, has already started issuing notices to all companies across the country, asking them for a report of this compliance, which means that suppose your company is working with 140 uh, contractors, A, you have to register each contractor and his work order on your own PF portal, which is now called the UAN portal. And every month you're obligated to verify the provident fund contribution and upload a file, which has the attendance, salary and EPF contributions of each worker deployed by the contractor. And through a system of TRRN verification, the government has also allowed you as a principal employer to verify whether the contractor has submitted a genuine provident fund statement to you or is it forged? So like I said, you know, silently behind the scenes, 
unfazed by the passage or, or non-passage of the labor codes, the government at the center and at the states is quietly implementing various objectives. So let me share with you, you know, my company's interpretation or understanding of the government's intention through our micro level implementation across states in India. We are working pan India right from Jammu and Kashmir to Kerala. As you rightly said, Professor Sundar, uh, following in the government's, uh, central government's footsteps, 12 states have already notified their draft rules. I, I want to you know, share another instance of not the, the government and the, at the center and state not waiting for notifications or parliament to pass bills. Uh, in another instance, <clears throat> the government has already opened up one window licensing. So today, even if you don't have 20 workers, if your contractor doesn't have 20 workers, you can easily voluntarily get a provident fund registration right from the PF portal, which is online. So the first intent and clear intent of the government is there has to be a public-private partnership around ensuring social security for all. It's like the earlier campaigns of Garibi Hatao. It's like the campaign of you know Roti Kapra Makan, and uh, you know uh, all 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 good corporates which have strong uh, you know social obligations or sense of social obligations of good corporate governance believe that since they're already paying those amounts of provident fund ESI or minimum wages to the contractor agency, they have accepted this mandate from the government to ensure through a proper compliance mechanism that the benefits are actually getting disbursed to the beneficiaries. So things like you know uh, making payments through an electronic mode, even before the labor court set it out, it has already come into existence across India. Uh, in Maharashtra, the government has even uh, said you cannot disburse bonus payments in cash. It has to be done electronically. So the intent of the government is that not only shall contract labor receive its dues in terms of social security, dignity of work, but parallelly the gig workers that uh, Dr. Mehrotra spoke about. Uh, I want to tell you, even before the labor code started talking about gig workers, many e-commerce platforms, some of them are our clients, are already under show cause notice and prosecute and being prosecuted by the Employees Provident Fund organization for not extending provident funds to the gig workers. So, you know, these are typically e-commerce platforms that provide food to us or they provide, you know, groceries. Uh, so they're already under notice even before the labor codes made it an intent. And our company, you know, sees this, sees this as a very, very noble intent. So, you know, at a personal level, uh, as a working woman, I could not do without an Amazon or Flipkart uh, or a Swiggy or a Zomato. Their services are indispensable for me to continue my professional life. So when I see the boys coming to my home, I'm personally thrilled to know that the government uh, has set a very strong agenda that each of them that comes to my home and to millions of homes, even during COVID, they risk their lives and they deliver food to our homes. Uh, they are going to be covered and the government is seeking partnership how they are telling the private companies do not engage with any agency or any gig worker unless they have an independent provident fund and ESI registration. We are all for it. The other intent of the government is, uh, you know, reporting e-compliance. So, you know, the, the inspector Raj was something that industry has complained about for a very long time. So the government has already put into motion, I can give you hundreds of examples, right from 2014, whether it's at the center or the states, e-reporting of the annual labor returns is already in existence. So the labor codes aren't saying anything new. Even at the state level, Haryana, Rajasthan, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, uh, except for Kerala, everybody is online. Uh, so the, 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 the increased compliance, Professor Sundar, you know, which could pain some corporates is that there are multiple reportings that you'll have to do. So on the one hand, the government, you know, is contemplating one registration, one return, one register. But on the other hand, you know, it has multiplied the number of e-reporting that each corporate is required to do. Let me share some examples. Apart from the huge monthly compliance already being done on the UN portal managed by the EPF, the ESI portal, the government uh, plans to bring in the existing Sham Suvidha portal uh, in a new avatar. Uh, they are planning to link it to the Ministry of Corporate Affairs uh, portal. As we know, any company you know, entering India can get not only its company registration, but also the PF and ESI directly from the MCA portal. You don't have to go to the PF and ESI. Now, government plans to link. 
and they want you to report, uh, you know, the bonus compliances, maternity, gratuity compliances on the Sham Suvida portal. Uh, they've also talked big about a new portal called Samadhan. So they've said that, you know, in this country, <clears throat> dignity of labor, labor rights, employee rights requires uh, an e-platform like, uh, you know, the, the Women and Child Ministry has introduced an online driven system called She Portal. Uh, and any lady uh, who's aggrieved of sexual harassment at the workplace does not need to depend on her private employer, but can go directly to the WCD portal and lodge a complaint. So can PSU employees. So extending that scheme, I believe, the government has made Samadhan portal the corner store of employee rights, employer-employee relationship, not only worker and employee. Uh, Professor Sundar, for the first time in India labor law, uh, the definition of worker and definition of employee have been distinguished. Uh, so they've been segregated. Not only that, so you know, uh, a, a worker is now treated as somebody who, who performs certain menial actions that does not require uh, a certain level of uh, literacy or education. And an employee is, has been clearly defined as playing an executive role. So uh, apart from you know distinguishing the two, the government has given both the right under the revamped uh, Workers' Compensation Act, which is now called Employees' Compensation Act, as we know, even before the labor court set out this intent that whether you're a worker or you're an employee, you can raise a grievance. The Employees Com Compensation Act Amendment uh, put uh, workers at par with employees. And they said that even if you're a highly paid employee, you can still claim employees compensation under the act. So now what the government is saying is that the every company, every establishment must have a grievance company uh, co committee. Any employee having a grievance should raise it online on the Samadhan portal. Uh, interestingly, Professor Sundar, uh, apart from you know changing the compensation structure, as Dr. Merota rightly said, the unions, uh, uh, the employers are up in arms against the 50% structuring of wage because that is going to increase the bill for gratuity, leave, encashment, and bonus. Industry is habituated traditionally to paying that only on basic. Now they are being told pay it on 50%, which is a huge cost. Yeah, yeah, apart from that cost, uh, you know there is also a cost of uh, looking at uh, you know ctc there are many private sector companies which offer a ctc structure of salary they don't offer an outright gross salary or salary uh, notion uh, there's another proposal in the social security code to bring down the contribution rate from 12 percent to 10 percent so many companies that offer a ctc salary to their employees are wondering how to balance that reduction in the epf contribution rate with the increase uh, in the overall bonus gratuity and leave encashment bill uh, so, so the, so you know the, what the government has clearly mandated and already brought into. Like I said, you know the silent revolution behind the scenes. Another instance that I'd like to share with you, apart from the UN portal compliance, is the standing orders. Uh, I was surprised to find at a personal micro level, uh, Professor Sundar, that even during COVID, states like Uttarakhand and Uttar Pradesh and Telangana were not issuing contract labor registration renewals unless the company came up with a standing orders. So we had many clients, you know, who had never had a model standing orders, but because they were obliged to get their contract labor RCs, registration certificates renewed, they went back to the drawing board and they actually came out with new standing orders. So, uh, you know, that's again something which the government has already done, that uh, the, the employer and the employee, their relationship to be based on mutual trust, uh, that the working conditions or employment conditions must be documented. So today, even before the codes have commenced, the IR code, standing orders, at least a model standing orders has become the norm of the day. Otherwise, you'll not get your licenses renewed. All the states, you know, most of the states have implemented. So the first thing I spoke about was enhanced contractor compliance. You can deploy contract labor. You don't need a 240-day sham, but you need the contractor compliance to happen and to happen online. Because the government has said, I'll keep you free from inspectors provided you're online with me. Secondly, you know, increased reporting through multiple portals, UN, US, uh, yeah, ESI, uh, Sham Suvidha, and Samadhan are only the starting portals. At a micro level, the states have their own existing portals on which we have to file compliance. And the third thing I would say is, you know, a lot of policy making that they want you to document in terms of model standing orders. For the first time in India, the definition of employee now includes fixed term employees. So the, the exciting news for industry is, that not only uh, you know, is contract labor hiring uh, legitimized, but I would like to add another flavor. They've eased it up so much that they've said, 
again, you know, for a first time, this is very, very diametric, revolutionary. They've said that if your industry has or your company has traditionally used contract labor for the entire manufacturing, that will not be prohibited. So this is unheard of. They're giving in writing that contract labor traditionally used in a company or in an industry or manufacturing process shall not be prohibited provided compliances are in place, mainly the appointment letters and social security. Secondly, they've gone a step further to say that, you know, if your industry is, uh, is, is, is having certain activities that do not require full-time uh, workers, then, you know, you can have 100% contract hiring and we have no problems as long as social security is in place. So that's the exciting thing. The other exciting thing from an employer's perspective uh, is fixed term employment. So again, you know, the, the labor codes didn't have to tell us that we already knew in 2018 April, the Ministry of Labor legitimized fixed term employment. Nobody speaks about it. You know, that always uh, surprises me and worries me that, you know, people are not reading and not connecting the dots. Of course, to some extent, the government and its uh, PR machinery is responsible because they should be connecting the dots. They should be issuing FAQs and they should be making it clear to the public at large that this is what the government has already done. So I'm again, you know, submitting to this audience that fixed term employment had already been notified by the Ministry of Labor in 2018. It's very, very exciting. Now you can put it into your standing orders. You can hire people for two months, three months, six months without any fear of, you know, contract labor obligations, except they've said that even if somebody is hired for a month, the PF, the ESI and proportionate gratuity and, and maternity is applicable. So fixed term employment is again something, you know, which is interesting and which is very, very exciting for employers, contract labor, fixed term, you have it your way provided you are ensuring the dignity of labor or your employees and there is no exploitation, which is a very good thing according to us. Now coming to, you know, to, to wrap and uh, to coming to a critique of what needs to do better. And the reason why, you know, we were interested to participate uh, <clears throat> in this debate, uh, Professor, is uh, we, we hope that forums such as yours, uh, which have uh, the years of the government, will write to the government on certain, I would say, IT challenges. You know, so for instance, uh, whether it's the UN portal or the Samadhan portal or the Shamsavida portal, uh, the IT backbone or the budget which is given to the Ministry of Labor uh, is peanuts compared to the budget which was given to a GST. So while the intention is fabulous, and, and we have seen over the last four to five years, our practical grassroots experience has been phenomenal. Uh, the drive against corruption through e-licensing, e-inspection, e-reporting has been phenomenal. Uh, it has you know, squarely put many offenders uh, in, in the government you know, who, who were perpetuating the Inspector Raj to book. They can't get away with it. My only grouse or my company's grouse is that because the labor ministry is not as glamorous maybe as the finance ministry, adequate budgets and adequate attention has not been paid to the IT infrastructure, which is sorely lacking. I'll give you an instance. You know, while they've said that licenses are going to be online, it is still a petty junior labor officer who has the right to sanction the online license. And most of the times, even in a you know, prominent state in Karnataka, we've spoken to the labor secretary in Karnataka also and complained several times that the portal you know, rarely functions even for routine issuances of licenses. So through this forum, I hope you know, the government gets its senior officers. Uh, I have worked with senior labor officers who didn't even know how a license is issued from say a e-district portal of Delhi. They, had no, they have no idea how a contract labor license is issued. Uh, for instance, you know, the portal doesn't allow you to upload documents beyond 100 KB, but they require you to upload contract labor agreements, which are at least 3 MB. So, you know, senior labor officers who are behind the codes and behind the good IT intention need a proper training. They need to know, you know, their system so that they can understand the pain of the public, which is the corporates and the PSUs. So, uh, uh, with this, uh, uh, Professor Sundar, our submission or our counter view from SQL is silently, many of the government's objectives under the four labor codes have already come into play through digitization, through e-inspections, through online reporting, uh, and most importantly, through coverage of the contractors uh, uh, by making the principal employer even more responsible. And now what the draft rules of the 12 states have come out with Professor Sundar is, 
that uh, the states shall be responsible for maintaining a separate provident fund for gig workers and platform workers. And the employers, the aggregators, uh, you know, like an Amazon, Flipkart, Swiggy, Zomato, uh, they will have to contribute not to the EPFO, but to the state provident funds to maintain this compliance. So that makes, you know, the compliance for the principal employer slightly more complex because you'll not only be reporting compliance to the EPF, but you'll also be reporting compliance to the different states, all of whom will be maintaining separate and different state PFOs. So uh, with this, uh, you know, I conclude our counter view, uh, Professor Sundar. Thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, thank you, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Sarkar. Um, it has been a pressure listening to you, um, giving us the practical side and uh, your point that a silent revolution has already been occurring even as even before the labor courts, uh, um, you know, they were even, they were not even born at the time. So you had cited a number of instances, uh, particularly the way the employers provident for an organization has responded uh, to the, <clears throat> uh, to the, submissions made by employers of all sizes. And you also talked about the e-commerce companies have been, have been held account accountable with respect to provident funds. And of course, the uh, substantial amount of liberalization has taken place with respect to physical inspections. All, all, uh, all good things have happened, which uh, definitely have eased the tensions on the part of employers and the contractors, which is, which was a very great pain point uh, in terms of ease of doing business. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you rightly raised uh, the questions that have been ringing in all our minds, whether the government would be able to, uh, central government as well as the state governments, would they be able to raised to the IT challenges that would arise when the compliances, registrations, issue of licenses, renewals, all, all kinds of things are going to be uh, digitized. And we now know that, the, that the, we can't uh, you know, upload our IT returns because of the finance ministries, uh, the IT website uh, is uh, undergoing problems. So that's the biggest challenge and you have also rightly said the Ministry of Labor and Employment doesn't get uh, the kind of resources that the other ministries get. So thank you very much for providing the compliance perspective on the part of employers. And my only, uh, I have just two queries, of course, Mr. Iyer will be raising uh, uh, more, more pertinent issues as a discussant. I, one thing is that, uh, you know, the fixed term employment is all right, but as a labor economist, I have a question. Between the fixed term employees and the contract workers, if I were a profit maximizing employer, I would rather prefer the contract workers than the fixed term employees because the monitoring costs, the social security, payroll tax, maintenance costs, et cetera, are shifted on to the contractor rather than the principal employer when it comes to contract workers. But when it comes to the fixed term employees, the entire honors and onerous tasks will be on the principal employer. This is a labor economics perspective. So uh, again, uh, Professor, you know, I'd like to give you the practical perspective from. Oh, I, you, Madam, you can come at the end. I, you, you may you may yeah. just jot down. That is uh, question number one. Question number two is that the gig workers figure in the social security code, and but nowhere in other codes that raises the question where a gig worker is a worker at all in the technical sense. So these are the two major concerns I have to ask apart from the IT concern. And I think that uh, digitization is a kind of an elitist business perspective rather than the MSME perspective that you may want to respond to. Sure. Thank you very much, Anantalas, for pointing out the silent revolution that has been taking place. And the codes are legitimizing or implementing the revolutions that have already happened and uh, organizations such as yours have played a very important role. Thank you very much, Ms. Sarkar, for your very, very important intervention. I would, so, just, I, would, I, I would just like to raise two points, just two points. Sure, sure, sir, sure, sir. Yeah. 
Uh, the first thing is about, you know, we are talking about 94% of unorganized sector in this country. So I would like to highlight that as to how these compliances and are the enforcement inspectorates ready to, you know, even deal with that. Do we have that infrastructure? Point number one, which uh, Nandini also talked about. And uh, the other thing is about, I rightly see that, and that's going to the biggest challenge that she pointed out, is about the IT challenges that are going to be there and with budgets not available, all fine. My worry is about implementation enforcement. It's uh, and the, even the IT challenges faced by the 94%. We are talking about 6% organized corporate sector who can really meet all this. And they would also be facing, uh, you know, facing challenges with it. How are these 94%? And if they, those people are not going to, okay, who do not even pay today minimum wages. Okay, who do not comply with any law, are the inspector rate going to go on giving show cause notices, etc.? How is this is going to be dealt? It's one thing that I want to put it in perspective. Thank you. Thank so you, sir. Thank, thank, you, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank now you. it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Pallab Bandapatyaya, who I mean, who of course, uh, uh, you know, we all know in XLRI, he has been associated with XLRI for long. Uh, he is a founder of HR Plus and he is very closely associated with NHRD. Sir, it's my pleasure to invite you to share your views. Thank you, Professor Shamshundar. First, let me give a preamble. Uh, something, some discussions which started by Dr. Rajan Marotra, whom I heard him many times, and then my super guru, E.M. Garu, uh, with whom I meet every year when I go and teach at XLRI. So I will give a very different perspective, and I must say that in my whole career, uh, you know, my experience directly uh, relating to manufacturing sector is very, very less. I represent the gig economy. Only after consulting career, which started about seven years back, of course, I have seen various kind of industry, starting from the largest newspaper in the country to the largest bank, to the largest pharmaceutical company. Okay, so here I go. The first thing, as I said, my views and counter, counter views are together, my apprehensions. I won't say counter views, counter views because I have heard how Mrs. Uh, uh, Nandini Sarkar has given her logic. Okay, I don't think I will stand up to that scrutiny. But I'll ask some fundamental things and probably since you have invited me, I'll give you the geek perspective. Uh, the first thing is, it has made life simpler on the top of it. Throughout my life, we never had a labor relations department. I have worked. And in 37 years now, I am my working and consulting career. 31 years as an HR head, world head, and global head, and so on. And I'm also a specialist in setting up the what is called the outsourcing center for MNCs. Most of my life, I worked for MNCs. So from an economist point of view, this will probably increase the FDI. The second thing I do and what I teach in XLRI, as you know, mergers and acquisition, which I have done uh, quite a number of them and strategize them and I teach, but I teach only the human side of the mergers and acquisition. So <clears throat> foreign investment will be better because almost all, I have worked with Americans, Europeans, Singaporean, you know, everybody is scared of Indian labor laws. So at the face of it, simplification is a great thing. You know, putting uh, Industrial Dispute Act, Industrial Standing Order Act and Trade Union Act under one code is great. The second thing I want to tell is that this whole notion of FT, fixed term employment, which is extended to everybody. And I must tell you, I'm not talking about FT, what you are all talking about. I'm talking about full-time equivalent. That's my language from the gig economy. And you know why? Because that calculates per person productivity in organization. And what does per person productivity determines? It determines 
the market cap of an organization. All of us know. So finally, I want to go back to a book written by Charles Handy in 1983. The book was called The Age of Unreason. And there he talked about a shamrock structure. What is the shamrock structure? He said, there will be three kinds of employees in the organization, which to some extent answer your question, Samsundar. That core employees will be everything. They will get best of the benefits. How does a core employee define? It depends on the business model. What is Amazon? It's not a retail company. It's a tech company. So you know what percentage of the people are tech and what are their benefits? I'll give you another example, very successful example, Big Basket. They made the organization as a retail organization because the founders are coming from retail and steel industry. The head of HR for Big Basket spent 15 years on the shop floor of XLR, a Tata Steel. Very unusual background, I know him personally. Okay, so he defined that as a, so the proportion to which he care the employees is better on the business model. So Charles Handy said this model in 83 and every organization, and I challenge everyone in this panel, if not following this model, core employee, then they said peripheral or what we call it as contractual employees. The pantry staff, and there are too many levels in IT. Pantry, security, support staff, audio visuals, those who help you in audio visuals, those who help you, and software engineer, because it is given to contract. Multinational companies employ the top most IT companies. I have employed TCS, Infosys, Wipro, you name it. They're in the same premises. Are they discriminated? Probably yes. The biggest question for me when is to give t-shirts my head office will send number of t-shirts telling that this many number based on FT. So soon two same fellows who has passed from the same engineering college, probably one has done two physics and rights. So he got into IITs, he's on my payroll, fixed full-time equivalent. The next man is from TCS, he's a contractor. So that's the thing. And I tell you, every organization worth this salt today is following Charles Handy's model to the intent of maximizing profit. Maximizing profit. Simple example, when Tata Steel took over this company and all of you know Bhushan Steel, the first thing they, they figured out, eh, there are 12,000 employees and they were working in 12 hour shifts. So when Tata still went there, and I had my friend, ex-CHRO, he said we were greeted by union with Farwak because Tata still decided, come whatever may, we will have eight hour shift. I can tell you so many horror stories. I have done due diligence for multimedia. Now you are talking about raising it to 100 to 300. Many, many startups, I sit in the two startup boards in Bangalore. I live in Silicon Valley. Most of my clients are gig workers. I have two apprehensions. One is if this model is going to be there and that is this every model. It started all kinds of company. The first to start in India was Airtel. Airtel doesn't want anything but sales and marketing. It came from the foreign shoe companies, Adidas of the world and Nikes of the world. They only needed a brand. And Airtel has the most successful organization example. We teach people how they outsourced everything. 
So outsourcing is going to increase. And what will happen? Those small outsourcing company, uh, Nandini has spoken about his organization. I've also worked with the largest outsourcing manpower companies in a consulting assignment, the top management. I'm not a man from the ground, I must admit. But I'm telling you the fundamental business model is it going to change? And 100 to 300, what is going to happen? I will go to the other side. Definition of industrial disputes has been changed to include termination, retrenchment, layoff, and dismissal. Earlier, what was said? Terms of un unemployment. Now, spirit, it is fantastic. Dr. Rajan Marotra talked about 15 days salary. I will tell you some of the most profitable company in India, in the IT sector, doesn't give more than that for per year of service. And by the nature of the service, as you know, everybody wants to go as a good ambassador. I myself has worked for 10 organizations in my life. So the first thing I used to tell my HR team that if you feel you are not adding the value and company is growing faster than you, it's your choice. I can't, I have the moral, don't have the moral authority. I have always done that. But I've reached certain phase of my career and then I did that. So that's the other side of the story, right? So what is going to happen? I'm very glad, but why it is there? So that is the other thing. And recognition. And that too, 51%. As you know, the entire gig economy has no legalized union. It's only had started in Bangalore. And even IT, what about BPO? Millions of people get. There are very positive side, lot of people get. But what we are doing with this organization, please understand, I'm an HR person, and therefore I talk from a psychological perspective. <laughs> Unlike earlier days, even workers are greatly educated. I have my friend H.N. Srinivas, who worked for Tata's for many years. And when Tata was making Tata tea gardens, they had a major problem in finding labors because most of this, their sons and daughters have educated. They don't want, but still they went on, went ahead, probably because of the Tata group's philosophy. Hindu, whom I work with, has serious problem, though they looked after the union, they have a political union. I don't want to get into that, but they have equal problems. They got a guy from McKenzie as a CEO, he's still there. He was given everything except the editorial, which was kept with Ram. Okay, so he said, how can I transform this organization? As you know, uh, you know. So these are the fundamental issues. The second word uh, is the term used as Inspector Facilitator. I remember something I learned from one of my guru, Peter Block, the very well-known American OD person who's written many books like stewardship. Even his own country, he was thought is more left-oriented. But he consulted some of the largest organization in the world. So he came to India to do some work when I used to work for Dr. Kurian. So I was the internal consultant and he went to Lal Bahadu Shastri National Academy. And uh, that time the director was B.S. Yugandar, who is famous more because of being father of Satya Nabila. So I remember I was very young and he said, what are these officers called? I say, he said, I said, Indian Administrative Service. He said, what? I said, Indian Administrative Service. He said, administration and service? Can these go hand in hand? 
in private, of course, right? Because he is the book person who look, uh, wrote the book Empowerment. So the question is, question is, what is the business philosophy driving today's business? We have other examples. We have Dola Kiya in Surat, who gives Mercedes Benz to his workers. And look at the kind of appeal that in social media it has got. How many forwards I have got, I can't. He's all these things are there, right? So, and there is two more point I want to say, and uh, this, even here, as Dr. Marutra, Dr. Marutra has very pointed out, there's nothing fixed. What about retrenchment? I, I am a specialist in mergers and acquisitions. How do you protect? And what happens in gig economy? You take our organizations, which are less than 300 people. And there is a big danger looming large. One is this business model, which bound to bring in equity. I was working with the largest bank in India in one of their most fancy training center. And I will tell you the story. And I, their security guards are real top class. Every time they see, they're very well dressed and they will say Jai Hind. What I liked about them is Jai Hind because I guess most of them are ex army So like that, I came in the first day and I saw a young man. And next to it is a TCS office, okay? So one day I was standing after the whole day session, I used to go and take some fresh air. And I saw this gentleman and I couldn't recognize him in the morning because he was dressed in a t-shirt and a jeans, not the cheap one, the expensive ones, right? And at that time only, the TCS office closed for a shift. And that boy spontaneously mixed with this crowd and you can't make it out. Now question is, what about his aspirations? There is no union, yes. Because remember in India, Gusharan Das state once said, the biggest aspiration comes from the moment you are able to speak English. That's already happened in BPO. It's happening with the security guards now which is the biggest contingent, they train to speak English. Will they not have aspiration? Will they continue to see this difference? Is it not a tickling bomb which is happening? Not today, 10 years hence. Is it some of the perils of service economy that we are so proud of? Which Professor Henry Minzberg says, Legitimizing is still very old, but I like his writing. He said, HR will go to dogs if it doesn't take care of the community. I have represented corporate interest always and every time. Perhaps at this fag end of my career, I'm not a man from the ground, but these questions looms large in my mind. This is some of the macro perspective. I, some of the things are good, right? So 300 and more is one point. Everybody is talking what is below 300. Employee has been broadened that Nandini has already spoken that uh, they are called employees now. And we often are very, very familiar with the term called employee engagement. Being XLRI, everybody, drop of a hat, talks about employee engagement, corporate citizenship behavior, right? Yes, there are progressive practices, but what about this, right? So I'm not getting into social security code, 
So this platform, it is good that they are getting. I have seen companies, large companies, not paying the PF. Large companies in IT sector. I have seen some of the most white collar crimes in the IT sector while the process of doing the due diligence. I have done close to about 100 due diligence, all small companies. But today, every company's motto is to take care of the core workers. And more and more facility you take, take care. And then there is another thing which is happening, which is natural, and I don't blame anybody. The technology is getting obsolete faster than what even you can blink. As they say, a research, a millennial has a maximum span of nine seconds. Yeah. And that's the rate with which the technology is changing, which means more and more people are getting redundant. And on the other hand, all of you are much more knowledgeable everywhere the standard saving rates are going down. So you need to work like 70, age of 70. My friends always used to tell, Pallab, you came out on your own volition after 34 years. In the corporate, you still have life to enjoy. You have made enough money through ESOPs. So you enjoy. See here, we are struggling. We have to work 65, 70, otherwise we can't survive in US. So here you have to survive. But another thing is, you have to ready to get laid off at the age of 40. What number of so-called middle level managers have been laid off in the IT industry? If you are able to upskill, you survive. If you're not able to upskill, what happens? And I am a, <coughs> the world uh, survey, IMF says, as you know, roughly about 60% of the jobs which deals with primary information technology will be done by AI by another two to three years. The only thing, for God's sake, they cannot do is creative thinking. That's why they're saying the topmost skill even in Harvard is creative thinking. I only hope people like Elon Musk probably will be able to create something and then uh, human being is the danger. But the other side is of course there, IT is going to help so many people and what Nandini said is absolutely correct. What is happening, the biggest example is the income tax uh, portal. Now you can see it is nobody's intention to bring people, but do we have the technology? Do we have the bandwidth, simple bandwidth? So with that, I end my view. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Palabji. Mr. Ayer, are you there to raise your questions? Uh, in fact, I think uh, many of the points have been touched earlier by some of them. But I really see the challenges. And I think here somewhere I was looking at from the point of view, I'm not raising a question. I'm just reiterating certain things. My concern is again about the IT challenges, point number one. The enforcement, second. Again, I'm reiterating. And the third is how do you really connect with people? I think you know that is the real challenge. How do you really touch people's lives? How are you going to manage community? So these are some of the points that I want to raise, and these are very important issues. Otherwise, now there is something called, which Dr. Pallab talked about 45, 50 years, people getting redundant. And that's what, you know, guys standing talked about precariat. How are we going to deal with this? Is there a plan within this country to deal with anything like that? So these are some of the views that I would, with that looking at time, I would hold on and uh, request Thank Vishal. You. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ayer. Uh, Pallavji, thank you. Um, perhaps your talk will uh, attract more FDI because uh, you feel that the codes have made uh, life simple for the foreign investors. And you must be knowing because uh, you, you being a high profile person all along, uh, 
uh, must be having uh, the pulse of the foreign investors and multinational companies. So your views will be taken quite seriously. Um, and of course, you talked about the, the organizational business model, wherein you have a core, depending on the business model, and then the peripheral. Of course, in labor economics, uh, Professor Atkinson spoke about around the same time that you mentioned in the early 80s. There'll be a core and there'll be a periphery and uh, all those things. And of course, Mr. Ayer has spoken about the rise of the precariat, that is the precarious proletariat, uh, which Guy Standing has coined the term the precariat. But I just have uh, two questions, uh, Pallaji. Of course, you, uh, you are uh, good at innovating things and I have seen how XLRA students have enjoyed your classes. FTE, you call it as full-time equivalent, I hope so. Uh, I really hope so that they are full-time equivalent, which you can um, which you can shed some light on them whether uh, FTE will be full-time equivalent or not, and uh, whether they will be. Uh, again, I repeat uh, what I said to Ms. Sarkar: whether they will be preferred to the contract workers. But the most important point that we have to uh, ask is that the gig economy is driven by algorithms, even the Operators have no control. Even the engineers who have designed the, uh, the, the technicians who have designed the algorithms don't know exactly how the algorithms work and how do they distribute to work and how do they insert, I mean, how do they operate us? We, we do not know the uh, optics of operation. And is, is it not time that uh, we have some technical law to have some kind of a algorithm audits in order to know what exactly happens and how work is distributed? Is there any prejudice which goes against some workers? Is there some kind of a, a, you know, a mal distribution in the allocation of uh, jobs and tasks? That is something that I would request you to uh, think about algorithm audit and uh, the, can there be transparency in designing of the algorithms? Uh, with this, I will go to Mr. Michael Dias, whom I have heard, had the privilege of uh, hearing off and on. And uh, uh, as a part of ILO assignments, I have interviewed him. And he has been very closely associated with, with the Indian Labor Conference. And he's also the secretary of the Employers Association. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Professor Shamsundar. Thank you very much for inviting me and having me this evening. Uh, as you are aware, during the last 30 years, I have had the privilege to work on the amendments in labor laws. On behalf of the All India Organization of Employers, of which I continue to be a committee member. I was a member of the Second Commission on Labor chaired by Mr. Ravinder Varma and was on the subcommittee appointed to examine labor laws applicable to the organized sector. Hence, I have had the opportunity to be associated with this process of change and amendments in the labor laws since very long. At the outset, I think we need to understand and appreciate that the labor codes have been enacted to reform our laws that regulate employer-employee relations. Their objective is to bring in flexibility in the labor market, as also growth in the economy and efficiency of scales of production. The existing laws were remnants of an archaic past, ineffective for workers and unnecessarily burdensome on the employer and therefore are best dismantled. However, for us to meaningfully engage with the debate on labor reforms, we ought to first ask ourselves, what do labor laws actually do? Or what are they meant to do? What role do they play in an economy? The first and perhaps most obvious function of labor laws is to protect the workers from wage fluctuations, substandard or dangerous working conditions, 
and precarious and insecure employment. But why is this protection needed? Because without them, workers and employers would enjoy unbridled freedom of contract as simply buyers and sellers of labor. This by itself is not undesirable, provided that the parties are equally placed. But freedom of contract between two greatly unequal parties would mean that the stronger party could indiscriminately impose their will on the weaker one. In any event, and under no circumstances, can we have a regime of naked hire and fire since the constitution of India guarantees all its citizens the rule of law that presupposes that principles of natural justice shall always be adhered to. Now, I would like to, uh, with regard to the four labor codes, I would like to dwell briefly on the industrial relations code and focus on a few aspects of this particular code. To my mind, the grievance redressal committee, which although it exists under section nine capital C of the existing law, to my mind, if implemented with sincerity by the employers, disputes should substantially reduce, most particularly when you read it in conjunction with chapter three of the IR code and section 14, that provides for recognition of negotiating union or a negotiating council. So therefore, to my mind, uh, the grievance redressal committee needs to be strengthened. It needs to be appropriately implemented. And as you are aware from the grievance redressal committee, even raising a dispute before conciliation would not now be automatic it would need to necessarily go through the grievance redressal committee. Now, having said that, the role of the trade unions to my mind would become extremely important. And I can clearly see a time when internal trade unions would be the norm rather than what we have been seeing over the years where outsiders have been dominating the trade union movement. So I do see a very positive participation of workers with the work of the uh, organization where they are posted. Now, under the Industrial Relations Code, there are provisions of uh, the standing orders being applicable to an industrial establishment employing 300 or more workers. I think it is a welcome move uh, because earlier when the figure was 100 and some state governments had even diluted it to 50 and 25 the West Bengal government, if my memory is right, had it at 20 or 25, you've got to have standing orders mandatorily. We could see the challenges and difficulties. Now, linking these standing orders with the model standing orders, and in the present case, you see, we've already had the model standing orders in the mining industry, model standing orders in the manufacturing sector. But the good news now is that even for the service sector, a model has been provided, which I think uh, makes good sense. I've had the privilege of studying it and examining it. I think it's a good document. And now today, what the employer merely has to do is to say that I would like to follow the model. And that's the end of the matter. So it sort of works out so well and beautiful in that sense. Now, also under the uh, new codes, as I see, there's going to be large opportunities for employment and variety of employment. I think, you know, we have all, you know, grown and lived in an era, era of, you know, I want job security. I want to join a company when I'm out of college and I retire from that organization. Or I join government and I retire from that mindset, I mean, I, I've studied it in Japan, for instance, which they call lifetime employment. It, it doesn't make any sense today. It just doesn't make any sense. Today, we live in a very dynamic world. Every day is a learning day for each one of us, irrespective of what our ages may be, irrespective of what we are doing per se in life. 
we've got to be dynamic we've got to learn new skills we've got to learn and understand new technology technology to my mind is going to be the big big issue as a member of the central board of trustees in the employees provident fund organization i'm currently a member of it and i have been banging them over and over again with regard to the very poor quality yeah. of services available uh, at the epfo per portal for 15 18 years i was a member of the esi corporation i used to have running battles with the director general with rick to improve the systems i remember it was wipro who was providing our services but we yeah. were just not satisfied with it yeah. now what has happened in most of these laws they speak of very beautiful and nice things but the reality is when you see on ground how epfo functions how esi functions let me be honest with you there there are miles and miles and miles for us to go uh, and uh, i do remember what nandini mentioned the uh, amount of money that is invested for it is abysmally low the amount of money invested for uh, labor compliances is is extremely poor and it hasn't improved over the years now i am not trying to point fingers at anybody but i am just looking back at what are the facts and what are the realities so to my mind there's going to be a boom with regard to uh, employment you're going to have people doing work from home and uh, let us be clear well, whether you are working from home or gig worker or whatever worker at the end of the day they are guaranteed three fundamental things the first is a minimum wage a guaranteed minimum wage it could be an hourly rate it could be a, a daily rate whatever but it will be there my own personal dream is that you and i would get our wages our salaries at the end of the day you won't wait for the end of the month to get your salary uh, when you are driving back home from your workplace your salary would be credited to your respective bank accounts and let us be clear all further future transaction transactions in the employment world that is even if you are getting a domestic help you will pay the person by way of a paytm or a bank transaction that era of dealing in cash is out and over once your transaction is recorded all those cases that we've been doing under section 33c2 of the industrial disputes act where the worker would say i did so many hours of overtime i did i worked on sundays i did this and pay me so much there was no positive way of proving anything one way or the other but thanks to technology thanks to the newer way of working so i can see women coming to the workplace would be far far more i am extremely clear apprentices trainees learners they will be prepared at the school level with vocational training i can see that happening so i can see a lot of positivity happening employment would would uh, grow substantially as i mentioned work from home uh, that is lending greater flexibility in the employment to both employees and employers in fact the engagement of gig workers platform workers home based workers contract workers are all avenues available for generation of employment and i think that is our number one problem in this country is employment so i, I could see that happening in a great way when i go back to the industrial relations code i find the worker reskilling fund too to my mind would go a long way in help providing more employment to workers however one of my uh, objections are however the codes do not have adequate mechanisms for effectively capturing the econ economic and other indicators at the workplace so let me give you an illustration 80% of our labor force in india is engaged in the informal sector and it is a matter of fact and record that they contribute about 50% of the gdp but there are no frequent and updated economic indicators available 
with government or with any other agency. So I would have looked forward that in the labor code, respective labor codes, adequate mechanisms so that you can trace what is happening. I mean, the whole country, including the judges in the Supreme Court, shed tears for the migrant workers. But look at the definition of a migrant worker. How do you address the migrant worker issue? Where is the data? Where is the statistics on it? It's absolutely nothing at all. Finally, I'd just like to wrap up so that I stay within my time frame. Finally, it is a fact that the last Indian Labour Conference was held in 2015. I have personally had the privilege of attending the same for the last about 30 years on behalf of the All India Organization of Employers. And the Indian Labour Conference is, in fact, the Labour Parliament where, like the international labor organizations, government, trade unions, and employers participate. They articulate and debate all issues impacting workers and the employers and the workplace. However, in the absence of such a meeting, the charge and allegation of trade unions that there has not been adequate discussions on the labor codes, to my mind, definitely has merit. Had the Indian Labor Conference been convened, and we have tried to uh, gently persuade government to have it, to have the Indian Labor Conference, but as you all know, there are a lot of political issues linked to these uh, matters, and therefore possibly it has not been held. However, I am a very strong votary of the Indian Labor Conference, I have seen how various labor laws over the years have got new impetus. I mean, I vividly remember the uh, law relating to sexual harassment of women at workplace or even the contract labor. I was on a specific committee on contract labor representing employers. This was uh, a committee constituted by the prime minister specifically on contract labor. And I remember when initially we would talk about contract labor, the trade unions had a complete no, no on it. And in about the year 2002 and 2004, by then uh, the trade union people were ready and accepting to discuss contract labor. I think there has been a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of media, uh, uh, incorrect media reporting on a lot of these things. So that is why the issue has sort of got muddled and puzzled uh, over the years. But I am extremely optimistic with the labor laws. I don't say that they are the best. I do agree that the very word wage in the code on wages is vexed. Personally, I can give you three interpretations as to how to interpret the term wage under the code on wages, but that's not going to help anybody. Yes, I know for lawyers, it's going to be paradise henceforth because you are going to have every issue challenged. I mean, a simple word like grievance has not been defined anywhere. I, we have been talking to the ministry, please give us for the word wage, give us a couple of illustrations. Don't redefine it. You just give us a couple of illustrations so that we follow your illustration and based on the illustrations, we'll implement it in our respective organizations. But I'm sorry to say till this moment, nothing has happened. So it's, a, uh, it's going to be a challenge as we go ahead. It's not going to be easy, but I can definitely say one thing for sure, employment opportunities will open up employers will be far more comfortable in hiring people. My problem over the last 30 years and plus has been uh, employers are so scared of engaging workers. They don't want to engage workers. Today, I believe you have more than adequate options, opportunities to hire people in a wide variety of manners. So the earlier the joke that uh, we lawyers would normally say that it is easier under the Hindu law to uh, divorce your wife. It's easier to you know, divorce your wife under the Hindu Marriage Act, whereas to get rid of a worker is not possible. All those aspects have dramatically changed over a period. And this old concept that I need to hold on to my job till I reach the age of retirement 
is no longer going to be valid because under the new law on fixed term employment, for instance, even if you hire a person for two years, you're going to pay the person gratuity. You've got to pay the person same wages as you pay anyone else performing same or similar type of job. So I can see a lot of more opening. I am extremely optimistic with what is uh, uh, to come in the future. I am confident the country will grow thanks to its labor laws also. Thank you very much, sir, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rayer. You would like to say? Uh, yeah, I just would like to say a few words. One is uh, regarding, uh, you know, what grievance redressal. So I don't know whether it would be grievance redressal or it would be, you know, a dispute redressal because, you know, it depends on the formation of the grievance redressal committee. And since and grievance redressal earlier has never worked. I have worked on the you know, shop floor at the micro level because the unions don't allow that. And once the unions are there, you know, whether it would be allowed to work as a grievance redressal is something that uh, I have my own uh, doubts. But, you know, I think there is where employee relations managers have a task to play. The other thing is about, you know, which I was talking about is uh, there are some good things which uh, we talk flexibility in employment definitely is there and I think uh, that is some of the things that have happened like wages definition and a lot of common definitions and clarity in definitions that is also something that uh, uh, will really make a difference but I am a little worried about it, like interpretation of wages and you know uh, how this is going to really pan out and the cost part of it as to how are the employers really get going to get into it so this these these are two three points that i would like to talk on the industrial relations board about also about you know how are these really today also we have four unions and five unions how are these negotiating councils etc going to work okay, are, are, is, is it really going to deliver see ultimately we are talking about a growing india etc but is it going to deliver or have we found solutions for it i don't see anything in this school Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you, Mr. Uh, Michael Dias, for a very uh, illuminating uh, perspective. As I said, that you have been uh, very closely associated with the labor policy uh, dialogues uh, for a long time. And uh, you are, I'm, I'm, we are very happy to learn, uh, see, uh, we are happy to note that you are quite optimistic about the impact of the labor code in the sense that um, employers would not be wary of uh, hiring workers. You know, earlier, they used to uh, be, uh, you know, labor under apprehension whether they could be fired, if economic circumstances demand or not. Those things have been dispensed with. If employers are going, uh, employers are going to feel free to hire, then, in a microeconomic sense, employment uh, should increase. And in a macroeconomic sense, employment generation should take place. And according to you, uh, the, the labor codes by uh, assuring a statutory minimum wage, uh, digital and modern and banking uh, uh, conduits of uh, payment of wages will mean security of uh, transactions. And of course, there'll be all kinds of employment that would, that would, uh, that would be uh, increasing in terms of apprentices, trainees, learners, etc., and work from home would be good. And you are also quite optimistic about the fact that the female workforce participation rate will increase and that should uh, be uh, that should be really calming our nerves because the CMA surveys and the periodic labor force surveys are not painting optimistic pictures. The current weekly status unemployment rate is as high as 8.8% stubbornly at that. And the female labor force participation rates are globally, uh, in terms of global comparison, very low, less than 20%. I hope the employers uh, would make the right labor market signals to attract uh, female workers into the labor market. I have a couple of pointed queries to you, sir. One is that, uh, do you think that the bipartite forums that have been created, particularly the grievance redressal cell, would they really make a difference? Unless and until uh, we attach a direct, the code attaches a direct penalty for 
not having a functional grievance addressal cell. Do you think that kind of a measure should be introduced in the code, a direct penalty? Secondly, uh, I thought that uh, standing orders, uh, they, they regulate and provide a disciplined workforce to the firms by redrawing the thresholds from 100 to 300. And uh, are they not, uh, I mean, are the labor courts, uh, are they not at cross uh, purposes in the sense that the standing orders would ensure a disciplined workforce and provide for mechanisms for undertaking disciplinary action. And you also said that the model standing order would reduce the transaction cost. And given that we have the model standing order, should we not look at 50 as a threshold from 100 rather than going in the reverse direction to 100 to 300? And we know that from the anniversary of industries that the 90% of the industrial factories would be exempted from the model standing orders. So these are my two pointed queries, sir. Uh, but I'm happy that you have stressed the need for reviving the Indian Labor Conference, which has been christened as a labor parliament by uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, the then prime minister of the national NDA government. Thank you very much, sir, for your very informed and illuminating uh, uh, you know, uh, views shared. You know, generally we reserve the best towards the end. And uh, we have Professor E.M. Rao, whom I call as uh, Bhishma Pitamaha of uh, labor law. And he has been, uh, he had been very closely associated with the XLRA where, where I work. And I have the pressure of seeing him every year. This pandemic has deprived us of his uh, very illustrious presence. And uh, it will be a pleasure to listen to Professor E.M. Rao. And of course, he has authored a wonderful book, uh, Industrial Jurisprudence, published by Lexis, I think. And um, it's a pleasure always to listen to him. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much. I do not represent employers. I do not represent trade unions. So I represent myself. So you can take my word as something, uh, an approximation to a, a, a ringside view, right? I would like to confine myself to two, three, at the most four of the issues. Number one, pardon me if I am very deterministic in my approach, because I have been like that. So <laughs> I cannot be otherwise. Number one, chapter 5B of the ID Act, including chapter 10 of the IR code, both are uncivilized. They militate against right to freedom of carrying on business, Article 19.1G. When an employer is not required to get permission to employ, why should he get permission to retrench people? As rightly pointed out by uh, just Mr. Michael, <laughs> even Hindu marriage, which was considered sacrosanct, for ages, till 1955, Hindu Marriages Act can be dissolved now. Now, we cannot get rid of a worker. Why? This actually, this chapter 5B is the root cause of many problems that went with large scale unemployment in this country from 1980s onwards. Not every employer was rich enough to float a VRS and shell down lakhs of rupees to the employees. And he knows that he cannot get permission from the government because government is politically oriented. The government gives permission to retrench workers. It will be in trouble in the assembly or whatever it is. So what they did, many companies, small employers, medium scale employers, this is in the public domain. ILO conducted a study. Mr. N. Mathur conducted a study. It was published. Employers stopped paying electricity bills. 
slowly electricity was cut and then they stopped paying water bills it was it was a plan for two years how to get rid of my employees i cannot pay lakhs of rupees i don't have the money what should i do i was myself a manager during that period your manager i know i know several companies in hyderabad itself in raudkala so and slowly brought the company to a point where the workers started feeling that it is going to be closed one day because the government doesn't grant permission start leaving one by one one by one so the number comes to below 100 after one year i closed down the country this is what has happened in this country thanks to mrs gandhi for her short sighted approach in amending id act and incorporating the chapter 5b this is caused more damage to the interests of working class because i myself was a trade union leader long long ago in 1965 to 1969 has done major damage to the working class and the employers the companies became sick but not the employers were not sick they, they had their, their resources very well uh, protected this is one thing number 2 contract labor it is not as if all the jobs in the company are going to be perennial it cannot be there is fluctuation in the market and the product fluctuation is there the demand fluctuation is there so i have to adjust my workforce to keep pace with the fluctuating demand so in such a case i should have some peripheral workers who i can engage for a temporary period of say why why months three months four months whatever it is secondly there are certain jobs You, which you do not, uh, which which do not require a permanent employment, gradual employment. Similarly, certain jobs have to be un- given on contract. And uh, uh, pardon me, madam, contract labor act doesn't. There is no such thing as we have for the first time legitimized contract labor. No, the contract labor act, old act itself says it includes both definition of contract. Act. The labor supply contractor, the job contractor, both are included in contract labor act. So there is nothing like that legitimizing, and further buttressed by sale case, in which the courts clearly said, if I judge bench, that the employer, the, the, the employer has a right to engage workers on contract basis. The law doesn't prohibit him, except. where the government prohibits in certain areas so this is very clear so uh, having gig work, the gig work as i am not going into that because that is yet to um, uh, really take shape in the course of time how they are going to because on uber there was a judgement given in a foreign country that they are employees of the company so we have to see how it is going to operate here third recognition of union the question of determining what is the method you have to use is it check out is it verification both are defective because i am a poor employee a worker i am scared of the goons who are there muslim men in the unions so i pay 10 rupees here 10 rupees there and we don't get it how do you verify how do you go by verification this we have faced actually in the company secondly check out you have got uh, um, 60 unions in the company like a company like bakaro steel it had 170 unions one time once upon a time with 70000 workers why should employer recover the money subscription and pay to the all the 170 unions you can you can ask the employer to recover the subscription and pay to the recognized union so then how do you go about recognizing the union the best method was secret ballot which every federation has accepted except intuc g ramanujam was against it all through his life but see intuc hms bms every union federal national federation has accepted and was still going on on and on so 
So I have to pay my tributes to Jalagam Vengalra, who was the chief minister, Congress chief minister, 1973. What he did was to hell with the NTOC. Is what he said. I am. He should an executive order. Secret ballot will be the, the, the mode of determining the sole, sole bargaining agent, representative character of the union. Of course, after that, a few other states have adopted that. And it worked well in the state. There were no problems. We had 40 years, we have seen it. It worked well in Andhra Pradesh, United Andhra Pradesh. Of course, it is there in the, in the upper division also. My last point. Uh, two more are there. Budget definition and negotiating council. Because these have figured in the course of discussion. Negotiating council. It is not something new. We used to have bargaining councils where there is more than one union with, say, for example, 35, 33, 32, this kind of equation. Nobody has got absolute majority or even simple majority of 48, 52, this kind of thing. We used to have proportional representation. And we used to tell them, Baba, this is the represent, this is the, this is the membership of the unions. You please select your fellow member negotiating team with proportionate representation. And they used to do that. And we worked, it worked well. And we signed 12 settlements with them in the course of conciliation as well as bipartite settlements uh, on day-to-day -day issues. So, it is not negotiating. Uh, there should be no ground about uh, uh, suspecting how the negotiating council is going to work. It is going to work well. It has been working well for the last so many years. Then comes wage definition. I am happy that the government has... Uh, set at naught some of the malpractices that kept into the industry. I blame the employers in a particular sector for this. 5,000 rupees is basic, 15,000 is HRA. Why? Oh, on what basis you have given this? I am asking the HR managers of all these companies. What is that proportion? Can we in 15 and 10,000 rupees? Because they are not taken into consideration for the purpose of indirect costs, like provident fund, bonus, gratuity, and all that. This high-handedness on the part of, I am sorry, I will say openly, IT sector particularly, all this mess is created by American-oriented IT sector in this country, BPO, ITES, and all that. Manufacturing sector doesn't do this kind of things because there are strong unions. I am from manufacturing sector. God, they're saying this kind of insanity doesn't inform the working of manufacturing sector. So, the way in which the government has, the parliament has amended the section, basic means, um, uh, wages means basic plus DA. Returning elements, of course, is given in seasonal establishments. It is not a universal thing. And any of the elements says, Beyond 50% will be treated as well. Excellent. This is, this is the way in which a, a, a government should select not the ulterior designs of certain employers who want to inflate their profits at the expense of the employees and the social security costs. It has been a correct decision. Now, <laughs> because this is all I teach in the class also. So, with these things, um, I close my session. Thank you. So you had some slides. <laughs> slides, but I, I don't know how to, how to uh, upload. This is not getting uploaded. Have you covered those points? Or... Uh, that this, uh, I, can, uh, I can discuss without, I, I'll send it across to you. Now, if you look at, you can, uh, uh, you want, uh, can I take another five minutes? That you can uh, do the share screen. Let me assist you. I'll send this across to all of you by email because now when you are on the on the online, it is not <laughs> getting uploaded. Since you have put in your uh, effort together, at the bottom uh, of the Zoom, bottom middle, there is share screen, green button. Yes, I, I did that. Uh, go, this is that. that uh, then go on to your PPT. Okay. It, it okay. Is... Now, yes. what are the significant developments in the IR code. Number one, deletions. I am interested in deletions. Conciliation board. Conciliation boards were created when there were 365 princely states. 
most of whom, most of whom didn't have the financial capacity to have regular conciliation machinery. This was hanging in the ID Act for 50, 60, 70 years. My God. And then court of inquiry, no court of inquiry has ever constituted in the last 60, 40 years at least. And then Khadi, labor court, dispensed with it. And, and we, along with it, Schedule 2 and Schedule 3 have been dispensed with. Now all matters will go to tribunal. Then national tribunal, right? Public utility service this is another thing. Public versus non-public utility service. Section 22 and 23 is public utility service. Only 23 applies to non-public utility service. This created a lot of confusion in the, in the country. Now all are treated on par. And then some of the things are workman is replaced by this one. Schedule 1, Schedule 2, Schedule 3 were deleted. Then modifications. The additions. Employee and worker. They have been clearly segregated. But if you look at the definition, both the definitions, there appears to be some similarity. Not identity, but similarity is there. But then, you go to the industrial dispute definition, it is very clear. Employers and employers, employers and workmen, workers and workers and workers. So, employee is not there. Similarly, dispute resolution, an employee who falls under the definition of employee cannot invoke the conciliation machinery or adjudication machinery. And some of the things are negotiating union, and which we discussed just now, trade union dispute, discuss a little bit later. And then worker. Worker is defined under ZOR. First schedule is the addition. Matters to be provided under the standing orders. Then comes modifications. Appropriate government, consideration proceeding. These are the uh, definition clauses which have been um, marginally modified. Right? Uh, retrenchment and all that. So on and so forth. And wages, of course, we discussed it. And also, second schedule, the unfair labor practices, third schedule, conditions of service, which was fourth schedule, it has been renumbered as third schedule. Operative provisions. Now, grievance redressal committee. First committee, of course, is there, which is dead for all practical purposes, universally dead. It has never been working for the last 50 years, at least, my experience. Grievance redressal committee. What is grievance? Have you defined? And Going to a grievance redressal committee is not a prerequisite for raising an ID before a conciliation officer or going to the tribunal. I, we don't go to the grievance redressal committee. We'll straight go to conciliation officer. Submit the charter of demands, come and concede, or otherwise I go to conciliation officer. What the management is going to do? This is this is a, a, I watch again. The same thing, Section 9C of ID Act has been some cosmetic treatment plastic surgery reproduced, but with no, with no substantial change, right? Come to trade unions. It provides for compulsory recognition. This is a good one. No negotiating. Recognition to be enforced for three years, extended up to five years, right? And civil courts bar. Earlier, trade union disputes were dealt with by civil courts between two trade unions and all that. Now, they go to the industrial tribunal. Adding others, MSOs to be framed by central government only. This is a good thing done. Actually, labor should be removed by a constitutional amendment and put in union list, not the concurrent list. The state government should not be allowed to play full with the labor legislation because some, some sense of uniformity is called for. Right? Now, employer can apply. MSOs directly or submit DSOs online, uh, draft standing orders. So this is for certification, section 30. DSOs certifiable if a provision is made for every matter set out in the first. It's the same thing which is there in the earlier provision, also section 9. Sir, if you can summarize quickly, yes. Huh? If you can summarize quickly, sir. Right click. No, no, sir, if you can quickly summarize. Uh, the, okay. oh, in the next round, you can touch. Uh, there are so I cannot quickly summarize because I have to read. Uh, okay, now you, you can uh, you can summarize yourself. Right, back to you. In the next round, you can incorporate this. 
Yeah. Right? Because and I'm that, when you ask a few questions, I'll, general features I'll discuss. Okay, okay, please. Hmm. Statutory apprentice is excluded from both the definitions of employee and worker. This is one great thing done. Otherwise, we had at least 50, 60 cases. Uh, UP Electricity Board, Mr. Sio Mohan Singh, the judges themselves didn't know what is an apprentice, statutory apprentice, what is a non statutory apprentice. They could not make out. Right? Employers, uh, the expression of worker classified under these following heads building worker, big worker, uh, social security board. It is not in IR board. Home based worker, interstate migrant worker, platform, self employed worker, unorganized worker, wage worker. And women, how they are going to administer social security benefit? We have to wait and see because I, I, I am confused with those things. Uniformed in the definition of employer, employee, and worker and wages across the board. This is the great thing. This is the great thing achieved by the parliament in this court. Radical change in the definition of wage, right? That we have already discussed. They have excluded production, productivity bonus, attendance bonus, HRS, CA, so on and so forth. General features, civil courts barred expressly. Earlier, there was no provision in the ID Act barring civil courts from entertaining IDs. On that, there were several cases, Frank. Right? Premier automobiles and all those cases. I tell you, it, it, it is never okay. Civil courts barred from entertaining trade union disputes. And, and not only trade union disputes, even industry disputes. The cumbersome procedure under Chapter 5 of ID Act expressly with IDA. In under section in uh, chapter of five, 10, you have to file five copies of uh, balance sheets, five years balance sheets, five years trading and profit and loss account. Mrs. Gandhi made a mess of this country and the industry only to remain in, in power. The so electronic medium, so and so, that is that. One important point is which the parliament lost sight of. Section 17A. Along with clause 17, two of IDA was retained despite the fact they were struck down first by AP High Court in 1997, saying that the court said a primacy of judiciary has to be respected. Judiciary will always frown uh, upon executive sitting in judgment over a judicial order. So, in uh, Telugu Nadu WS Federation, so and so, it was struck down. It was again uh, agitated before Madras High Court in 2014 in uh, Tamil Nadu TTT Association. And again, it was struck down, citing the addition of AP High Court. It, uh, the Madras High Court struck it down. So that is that. <laughs> These are the things. I'll, I'll forward to all the uh, participants this, uh, after this meeting is over. Okay. Thank you, sir. Right, sir. For Thank your... You. Uh, Wonderful presentation. As usual, you have been uh, quite uh, the argumentative Indian, as Amartya Sen would have called you, uh, <laughs> but a very powerful argumentative Indian you have been always. Uh, Mr. Ayer, would you like to, Dr. Ayer, would like to ask yeah. him anything specific? Yeah, no, I just wanted to, this, I, I am, uh, uh, you know, in person seeing the unscrupulous employees where they have, you know, uh, I, I remember a case when the minimum wages were about 3,500 and one of the employees had basic as rupees 10 and all the other allowances. I think that was due. There were a lot of PF prosecutions that were happening. And I think that is one, one of the welcoming things that happened in the change in the wages definition, like uh, Dr. Rao says. And uh, uh, another is Chapter 5. I think these are all certain things that, you know. But I would like to just state two points. One is, when section 10 doesn't find any place in the IR code, okay, now how are we going to get into core and non-core? Because like Chandra Babu Naidu did, non what is non-core has been clearly defined. So there is going to be a lot of ambiguity with respect. Can to I this answer part. this? Can I answer this, sir? Sir, will, uh, will, uh, all the panelists will be given time, sir. Yeah, uh, yes, I, I in fact, like yeah, in fact, I want yes, sir, to you can just jot it down, sir, please. Yeah. The other part is with respect to, uh, you know, industrial tribunal where there is going to be a judicial member and an administrative member. I think they have messed it up clearly. And I don't know how this is going to go forward. And I think somewhere, though, 
we have talked about you know employers perspective i think somewhere i would also like to look at the other part is do are we breeding employee insecurity okay like we have said that it should be 300 and all that okay how are we going to deal with this prob problem of people who are terminated people who are retrenched people who are it's very easy to say this but i think there are enough and more unscrupulous employers below 300 in smes etc i appreciate their difficulties in running the business but do we need to go to one end of the spectrum and not look at the general insecurity that could play in the minds of people and i think that is one of the most important pieces where trade unions have not accepted it at all and with a 331 majority nobody would listen to anybody that's i'm not nothing against anything but this is how things have panned out over a period of time and finally what when we are talking about uh, labor legislation like mr michael tai has talked about have we kept those three imperatives in mind while making these changes after so many years of discussion was this not an opportunity for that same 331 majority to really come out with laws which have which at least you know clear out certain insecurity in the minds of the people so i am only looking at there are you know judge made laws how are they going to be interpreted in the absence of section 10 how are many of the other you know supreme court judgments which are going to be interpreted it is going to be a, like somebody said a honeymoon for lawyers it is going to be litigating and i think we are going to see more and more disputes because a lot of things have interpretation finally i see here a lot of assumption of powers by the central government i don't know how it is going to happen because it is in the concurrent list and you know there is going to be a dispute the very fact that the states are not implementing today or bringing out with rules is only going to further widen that gap so these are my respected views professor rao i am no think when no one to challenge whatever you said but i have wanted to put views and elicit your views on all this thank you so much thank you very much uh, dr ayer uh, it has been a pleasure as a moderator to uh, to have uh, performed uh, even perfectly the role of a moderator and uh, it has been a pleasure listening to uh, people i mean such illustrious views from people who have who have seen the empirical realities either at the macro level or at the or at the micro level and um, the chat I'm, i mean uh, as employers they have been uh, vocal about the good things that the labor courts have done and also the so called bad things that the labor courts have done particularly the wages definition of course the myth has been busted by professor em rao i just want to uh, raise a very simple question to all the industry people there why should social security be a part of ctc because it's an investment employers can't be myopic about social security because social security is about the future about the future of not only the workers the future of the generations the posterity the the, the future of the families the working class families it should not be seen as a cost but it should it should be seen as a part of an investment uh, this, so i mean i i think that the wage that uh, the redefining of wages into three components basic wage dnl allowance the retaining allowance and we all know uh, other than manufacturing and mining sector nobody pays dnl allowance and retaining allowance is just a chimera so i i fully agree with professor rao uh, but what i mean the other other aspect that i would like to say uh, that i would like the employers to think about is that how can we strengthen the labor courts in terms of the gig economy of which uh, dr pallabandapathy has spoken of uh, uh, you know he had to had he had more time he would have spoken much more about it but all in all it has been a great pleasure and a privilege to have moderated uh the presentations made by people of such eminence and uh, the i see there are at least about 15 to 16 questions that have been asked i would request dr arjun kumar to take over uh that aspect of uh, the question answer session 
And with these remarks, I end my technical role as a moderator with thanks to IMPRI, uh, Indian Social Institute, the Counterview, but more importantly, to the eminent panelists. Thank you very much. It's at once a privilege and a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thank uh, the discussion, Dr. Iyer, for raising so many interesting questions, and I'm sure they'll be answered. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Sham, for inviting me, and thank you. It was a pleasure. Right. And sir, if you suggest we can go to each of our panelists for a way forward round for just one or two minutes to reflect if, if they want to suggest for the way forward. Sham, Dr. Arjun, you can carry the discussion forward. Okay, okay. So uh, let me go to, uh, in that order only, to Dr. Rajen Merotra, sir, first. Sir, in one or two minutes, if you want to summarize and also give your way forward. Rajan, sir, you have to unmute yourself, sir. Sorry, I see the labor court as a reality. It has already been signed by the parliament. It will get implemented. When I look at it, the contents of it to a large extent are similar to what were there earlier. But I also see one thing that when you look in terms of enterprises, it is the enterprise that decides the business model and the employment model. And this is something that will continue. The business model always keeps on changing. The type of business model that was there prior to the liberalize the opening up of the Indian economy and the post-1991 are two very different. At the same time, there are greenfield sites and the brownfield sites. The greenfield site does not inherit the employment model that the brownfield sites had and had to look at labor. I don't want to get into, but there are a large number of service companies that have come up where they use designation inflation and everybody is an executive and nobody is a worker. So the labor laws in terms of industrial relations does not even apply other than the social security. And the balance is subcontracted in terms of contract labor. So the business model on the greenfield side is very different. If you work in State Bank of India, you will have bargainable employees, not only at the workman, you will have a unionized officer workforce. But if you work with Axis Bank, HDFC Bank, everybody is an executive, nobody is a worker, none of these laws apply. So one has to realize that the business models will keep changing. I gradually see that the app-based platform as a methodology of doing business will gradually go up. And one needs to see unions also have to find what they want to do. The laws are there to a large extent I did mention that when I look at the app-based platform, the employer-employee relationship is fuzzy. And most of these app-based platform call them associates and all those types of fancy designation. But I clearly see trade unions entering into it. It will go into litigation. And that I see as the future. Maybe much more will come out. And with this words, I'd like to thank the organizers for having invited me to speak. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Nandi, ma'am. Please unmute. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, I'm going to address four questions that I found along the way. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, Professor Sundar's question on what is the difference between FTE and contract labor? So, Professor Sundar, it's a difference, in, it's a difference between a mindset. Uh, in our experience of handling corporates, uh, they see contract labor as being menial and manual labor. And they see fixed term employment as being executive hiring for short periods of time. So clearly there is no difference because any contract labor agreement is also for a period of 11 months, 12 months, and it is renewed every year. The other question, Professor, that you raised was on the algorithm. So if you know the government is going to cover gig workers and the gig workers get work based on the algorithm, then how does labor law calculate the benefits? Uh, there's already a precedence. Uh, so if I may you know, take you to the provisions of the Gratuity Act, if you have casual labor and uh, you, if you have peace rated workers, the gratuity payable to them is based on the average wages earned over the last three months. So we anticipate that while framing the scheme for gig workers, 
the government will evolve a similar uh, average model of looking at the earnings that they have over a quarter and then deciding the contributions, uh, which is why, you know, when the Uttarakhand government set out its scheme for a state provident fund for gig workers, it said the contributions will be payable half yearly. It's not talking about a monthly contribution. So I think that intent or that precedence already exists in law. Uh, the other question that I heard was, you know, does the government have the muscle to implement? There are millions of gig workers, millions of unorganized sector workers. Yes, and the government has proved that it has the muscle. Uh, you know, it has uh, it has completely over uh, overlooked or been able very cleverly being able to ride over a Supreme Court judgment, which said you cannot link Aadhaar uh, verification to to benefits. But the EPFO, the labor departments, the BOC department, the LWF, the Labor Welfare Fund, have all cleverly found a way out. And even in a recent Ministry of Labor, uh, you know, a notification which I saw uh, uh, last week, you know, we saw a notification from the ministry that the NPS scheme for shopkeepers and self-employed will also be Aadhaar linked. So clearly, the Supreme Court judgment was interpreted in the light of certain rules and in the information technology rules which said that unless a beneficiary is identified, you cannot do it. Uh, you know, I would uh, I would like to say that uh, we should team up. Uh, I would really request Mr. Michael Dias. Uh, we should make a representation to the PMO. Uh, SQL has been very vocal in its 21-year uh, history. Uh, even recently during COVID, we approached the MSME ministry because we received, uh, you know, a very unfair GST notice because we refused to bribe the GST officer in Calcutta. So he, he issued a demand notice of six lakhs on us. I'm very happy to share with this panel that we escalated the matter without any you know, contacts. We have no contacts in the MSME ministry. Uh, the officer was not, the income tax officer was not only you know, share transfer, but our case was addressed by the additional uh, commissioner tax who called us and assured us that as an MSME, would, we would not be harassed and our case would be treated on merit. Uh, even regarding you know, prevention of uh, sexual harassment, I remember SQL meeting the then minister, Menika Gandhi, as, a, as an ordinary citizen, as an armed ar army. Uh, we have no political connections, we are not on committees, uh, but we approached her, we were granted an appointment, and based on our representation, the government has made uh, compliance, posh compliance reporting a part of every, uh, every company's annual report. Uh, so my submission to this esteemed panel, especially to Mr. M Michael Dices, that we should team up and you know go to the PMO uh, and tell them they're doing good, but this is what can be done better. For instance, Mr. Dice, you're on the central board of EPF trustees. I have talked to uh, officers in the NDC who have told me that even to get uh, video conferencing equipment takes them months, if not years. So how do they roll out uh, a huge implementation which currently covers more than eight crores unless there is adequate freedom and support in terms of budget? So the bureaucracy has to end there. And like I said, senior officers, but you know, I want to share with this panel that uh, in Haryana, the government has successfully implemented Aadhaar linking to labor welfare fund. They made large, you know, uh, they, those are some of them are our clients, which are thousands of workers. And to pay the LWF dues, the company was forced to link every worker and every employee and register on the Haryana government portal using Aadhaar, which is a huge exercise. So the government has flexed its muscles by linking provident fund contribution to Aadhaar and telling employers and employees, if you don't have an Aadhaar linking from next month, which is September, we are not going to accept your PF contributions. Through BOCW, through LW, the LWF, again through the Aadhaar linkage, it has proved that it is going to work. I heard someone say, you know, how are they going to dispense benefits to the uh, interstate, to the uh, migrant workers? Two ways. Uh, they've already issued circulars at various state levels and huge drives have been taken. Uh, a compliance measure that every factory and every establishment will have to do is no labor can enter your factory premises unless the ID card mentions the state of origin. Uh, I would like to share that many of our manufacturing clients have already started this exercise. So, the, you know, so we've seen that the government can get things done and they're asking corporates to partner in this program. So here, Mr. Dice, you know, uh, I would, uh, with you, we would like to represent to the PMO that just as in the recent Keynes uh, energy case, where the government lost the case and was forced to take back its earlier uh, circular on retrospective tax, similarly, we should approach the PMO and suggest that you know the CSR funding, even a Bhushan steel, it was so big before the Tata steel buyover, it, it, is, it used to have CSR funding. So you know to support employers in this compliance, the CSR funding 
should also be allowed you know so employer should be allowed to tap into the csr uh, fund uh, to to support and to enable contractor compliance and migrant labor compliance and gig worker compliance because that's going to be another uh, big uh, cost uh, the other thing you know uh, I would like to share with Dr. Pallav is that CQR has not only worked at the ground level, but at a personal level, I, I myself have done CEO coaching, where I've talked to CEOs and founders of large companies, which are some of the largest companies in Asia. And I've talked to them about things like ethical compliance, which unfortunately no MB Institute teaches. In fact, it's a standing joke that the shortest training that any corporate will give you is the one on ethics and compliance. But because, you know, people think that business and ethics is an oxymoron, it doesn't match. But I'm very happy to share my own practical experience uh, that as a corporate, CQ has stood very tall in its last 21 years. We have remained in business despite refusing to bribe any government officer. Our approach has always been or our credibility has come from the fact that we have contributed majorly to labor reforms in India, to ease of doing business and government has heard us. Secondly, you know, the training and education that is imparted in MBA institutes, uh, in famous institutes, I am an alumnus of uh, the Delhi School of Economics, but I can say nothing, nothing that I learned there helped me or stayed with me. Rather, it was the Prime Minister's motivational line, Sapka Saath, Sapka Vikas, that kept me engaged in contractor compliance monitoring for hundreds of companies, you know, that we serve across the nation, because that is what education is supposed to give us. It is supposed to make us empathetic. It is supposed to make us aware of the ecosystem. So five years ago, you know, talking about climate change and the ecosystem was unfashionable. Today, it is so fashionable that every company's annual report talks about its carbon footprint. Bill Gates had to come to India. I'm reminded about Swami Vivekananda. He said to make yoga popular in the world, he had to travel to the US. I'm glad to know that, you know, Dr. Pallav is based in Silicon Valley. Surely, and of course, you know, uh, Dr. Bandopadhyay, we all know that Bill Gates had to travel to India and make our industrialists sign the philanthropy pledge. This year, during Reliance's annual general meeting, it was very interesting to note that uh, Mr. Mukesh Ambani, despite his huge success around Jio, did not inaugurate the meeting. His wife did, his daughter did. And both of them, the wife and daughter, only spoke about the philanthropy that uh, Reliance had done during COVID, including you know, their immense outreach to create oxygen cylinders to support their employees. Uh, whose lives had, had gone to COVID. So uh, in my own experience, people who matter, the so-called big five consulting firms, unfortunately, you know, caught up in a web of trying to keep their contracts, trying to keep their clients happy, uh, are not doing a service to society. They need to have the courage to speak up. In my own 21 years with SQL, I don't remember a single instance, you know, talking to a CEO or to a director or to a CFO where our discussion on ethical compliance on Sapka Saath, Sapka Vikas has found disfavor. I do not remember a single company saying, we do not have the budget, we'll not do it. But my problem is, uh, you know, what are we teaching students in business schools? We are not teaching them that, you know, ethics matter or that, you know, being concerned about people who support your business. Uh, you know, there was also a talk that, you know, uh, government is yet to do it for gig workers. Uh, I remember, uh, you know, uh, a very famous uh, oil company approaching SQL. They had received a 10 crore demand notice from the ESI department for oil tankers. So, in uh, you know, the argument of this company was the oil tankers and the drivers do not enter the factory premises. Why should I pay their ESI? So, gentlemen, uh, you know, it's, it's already an established precedence under PF and ESI that the drivers, the operators, the ancillary operators that support a business have to be covered. And many PSUs also in this country have paid hundreds of crores in damages to PF and ESI because those drivers, those operators were not covered. So today, you know what the government is doing through its online IT outreach is going to be a normal progression of that. And uh, finally, you know, I was hearing about the hiring. Even today, this morning, when I was uh, listening to ET Business uh, News, uh, last quarter, the hiring was 7%, and that was even because of even due to partial lockdown. And in the remaining quarter, the hiring outlook is very, very positive. It's 9%.
largely fueled by IT pharma, as we all know, artificial intelligence. It's in huge demand. IT companies are facing an attrition they haven't seen before. Apart from that, you know, we have to recognize that uh, e-commerce has uh, grown in such a big way that the Indian economy, despite COVID, has not seen as many IPOs ever as it is doing now. So these businesses are actually creating a huge army of self-employed professionals who do not need to uh, be permanently employed with any company, but who can be ancillary businesses uh, for these e-commerce platforms. So with that, you know, uh, my submission on the way forward would be that we should team up and we should make a powerful representation to the PMO uh, on, on, you know, the glitches. Uh, because uh, uh, we've seen, you know, the PMO intervening in many, many cases and taking a very positive stand. Uh, it's an open secret that if you write on mygov.in, you do get a response. Uh, so, uh, you know, so that outreach and talking to the PMO directly, I think, uh, would be a very important step for all of us to actually contribute and make a difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, we will certainly try to uh, reach there also with the <clears throat> findings of this deliberation. With that, Talab sir, over to you. Your final words in a minute or so. Yeah. So please unmute yourself, Talab sir. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so I want to make three points. One is, I think the going forward model is also alternate forms of industry in a very large sense. The beginning of my career, I worked very closely with Dr. Kurian. So how all of you know what he has done to this country in the field of milk and how Amul is the only Indian company which stood top multinationals. So I think I leave it to you as a ray of hope is that now Ministry of Cooperation has been started. I only hope with right honest, it is used to, instead of politicking, depoliticking cooperatives from the shackles. And then I think we will dovetail the agrarian economy with the industrial economy, and that will be the biggest change India can bring. Second, IT industry is going to not only generate employment, but please remember, without IT as a country, we are doomed. We have no chance against China if we are not strong IT. Third, so therefore, we have to protect this industry, probably through very, very knowledgeable people, specifically, you know, in Indian employer association, I know in Bangalore, it is also very active, that very specific knowledgeable people and labor consultant like uh, Nandini and people like that should protect this industry instead of continuing it as Dr. <coughs> E.M. Rao has said, in real sense, that's a lot of reality in that it is taken up seriously and they have a lot of money they can spend. Third is upskilling. Upskilling is going to be the order of the day. Whatever way, if CSR can be broad-based, if an, even I don't think if it is special IT fund, it is created a certain percentage of profit to catch up because this is both mass learning and development can only be done through IT. So that is the third point. And, and fourth and last point is we not only take care of the employment, that's the basic fundamental need. Otherwise this country will see a social anarchy if the unemployment problem is not addressed, it should be number one item in government's priority, but also how to match aspiration of people along with their development so that 
conscientiousness doesn't remain an utopia. Equality remains a myth in modern day corporation. That's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And now we go to Michael Dias. Yes. I'll try and stick to the time. I'll just say it in one sentence in a, less than a minute. A, I am very optimistic. I am very confident that things will improve. I remember in the 1980s when we used to work, we found your chapter 5B as a big problem. And we found an alternative to it called the golden handshake, the voluntary separation scheme. I had fought in court on many of these issues, but we were able to succeed. So ultimately, I will say we Indian employers are jugadus and we know how to find ways within the meaning of the law without violating the law or breaking the law. We don't need to do any of it. Uh, employment, I can uh, mark my words, employment will grow, will flourish, uh, thanks to the new education policy, thanks to a lot of skill development and focus on those issues, just by way of information. The skill development department is totally, the ministry is totally a million miles away from the Ministry of Labor and Employment. So try and understand the dynamics are totally changing. The present prime minister is the only prime minister I know in recorded history who has stated in parliament that for heaven's sake, learn to respect the employers. They provide us with jobs, they run the economy. So all those earlier thoughts that job security has to be there and employers are exploiting, etc. I think they are all ancient, archaic thought processes. We need to rethink, relook. Thanks to your Twitter and uh, Facebook and what all, I mean, everything is there for the entire world to see. So in that situation, I think uh, uh, I am very, very optimistic of the times ahead. Yes, thanks to uh, the glitches or non-clarity on a lot of issues, you might have a, a field day in litigation, but that's just one of those small uh, prices, but I am extremely confident things will improve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And really, New India as a new opportunity, Palab Sir was also highlighting. Uh, now we go to Professor Rao, sir, quickly. Uh, yes. Uh, Professor Raya, I think you have a question I wanted to answer. Only I take only two minutes, not more than that. What is that question? I, I forgot. I hear, sir. Please unmute yourself. Huh? Uh, no, yes. I think I was mentioning about Section 10, and you immediately wanted to comment. Section 10 of? Of the contract labor. Right? Ah. The present. Time. Section 10 has been uh, incorporated as Section 53 or something like that. Yeah. 55, yeah. Mm. Mm. So, those four conditions, quadruple test has been incorporated in the revised uh, enactment. So, that is about that. Yeah. What is the point you were maybe asking? No, no. No. Today, if you really go to see, when people are working in the permanent, there are permanent uh -huh. employees uh -huh. and also contractual employees. Today, you see, we had a Maruti because in the same assembly line, people were working and there was discrimination. Okay. So, how are we really going to overcome all this is one of the important things that I was reading. Where you are engaging contract workers to do the same semi-skilled or skilled job side by side with your regular worker, you have to pay the same salary. There are no two ways about it. If the employees are not doing it, they are committing a crime against the society. There is no doubt about it. Number two, regarding the job uh, designations and all that we were talking about, uh, um, <laughs> Dr. Uh, Rajan Mehrotra has uh, pointed out uh, the kind of fanciful designations we come across in... Uh, sorry, Pallab, uh, sorry uh, for mentioning IT industry. Because all these things have taken birth in IT. Sorry to say this. Manufacturing sector doesn't do this kind of uh, insane things. Please understand that. Yeah. Executive, consultant, right? Like this, this kind of designations. Uh, Supreme Court has decided in half a dozen cases. Uh, Arkal Govindrajarao versus Sibagi India Limited. You know, they gave a designation to a clerk as 
covenanted contractual staff data and <laughs> elevated him as a manager. And he was sacked after that. He went to the matter and landed in Supreme Court. He said, in spite of the fact that he has been given ego boosting designation, the fact remains that he is a clerk and typist. So, if you leave it to the industry, we can have the wonderful designation like vice president, grass cutting, director, dishwashing, general manager, chapati making, and take away all the workers outside the scope of industrial law. The, super, the court looks at the nature of duties, regardless of decision, the designations you give or the salary you pay. The nature of job is operative, non-supervisory. He is a workman. He is a worker. Of course, in the in the uh, in the present uh, dispensation. So, with this, <laughs> I go. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Uh, Ayer, sir, would you like to make your uh, way forward remarks, please? Yeah. So, uh, what I would uh, like to say is, you know, just to summarize it. I think there are certain very good things that have happened. One is the mass casual leave that, you know, it will be deemed to be strike, 51% or more. The other thing is recognizing willful go slow as an unfair labor practice. I think that is something that is going well. Yes, 300 or more would, uh, the closure, retrenchment and layoff would help their missing their knees, etc. But uh, let us see how this really pans out. The other thing that you know, a lot of people talked about is flexible employment, women employees during night shift, common definitions, right? Uh, recognition of electronic records as a means, reduction in volume of transactional activity, you no know, number of registers, etc. But I also hear from Nandini that you know there are going to be a few more that would also get added because if you have to have strict enforcement and strict discipline, I think there will have to be. So I don't know whether there's really going to be an ease in maintaining records, though they have put it that way. I think there are also deemed approval provisions and uh, also compounding outfits. So these are some of the things that I want to really uh, highlight. And these have been good. I only think, you know, somewhere when you really implemented all this and, you know, there is where, you know, uh, the ultimately, you know, action what there happens, I think we need to be more, uh, it cannot be brutal. So somewhere I feel there is an usurping of ours and uh, we are also saying central government should take over and there should be one. I don't know how this really pans out, but at the same time, I think somewhere when you action it at the shop floor, action it at the ground, I think the principle, like all of us talk about, we need to have principles of natural justice and fair play. I think we are shifting towards, you know, taking a lot of things, you know, when we say both hands should clap, I, I always ask, where is one of the hands? Is it higher or is it lower? You know, is it clapping <laughs> like this or is it clapping like this? Yeah. So somewhere I think we shouldn't forget that both labor and management have to work together. Otherwise, if we go to one end of any spectrum, there is going to be danger. And here is where I would like to say Paritrana ya Saduna. And ultimately, you know, Lord Krishna has to come to come to play a leveling field. That happened in Maruti, we saw. I think there is where we need to be a little circumspect. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sham Sundar, for giving me this opportunity and a beautiful discussions. I think all the panelists added great value. And uh, I think uh, and I think people were also very clear and, you know, with a lot of conviction. So, and uh, thumbs up to all of you and great discussion thank you so much and very nicely summarized also sir and as our prime minister is saying sabka prayas so that is also becoming very important sham sir would you like to add it because no, no, i i think uh, i wish to thank all the panelists and the discussant right. for a wonderful time we had right. so thanks thanks so thank you everyone and for summarizing that everyone has to really work together uh, because everyone is working in silos government is often satisfied and we see the market body is not satisfied and the the spirit of animal spirit as we say in economics not unleashing there is a lot of gaps which can be really filled uh, and i really highlighted michael Vyasa and all of our panelists so let me just formally it's almost also supper time 
uh, propose a formal vote of thanks. So thank you everyone for joining on this our uh, special panel discussion on the future of labor codes, impact and way forward from employer's perspective, organized by Impre Center for Work and Welfare, Indian Social Institute, New Delhi, and Counterview. Uh, and I would like to thank all of our panelists, Professor Rao, Michael Dyasar, Dr. Pallobandha Paras, uh, for joining so early from United States and Dr. Rajin Mehrutra Sir, Nindri Sarkar ma'am, and uh, our discussions, MS Ayer Sir, uh, thank you so much sir for adding so much value to this deliberation. And of course, the curator and for directing this panel discussion, Professor K.R. Shamsundar Sir, and uh, our mentor, uh, Dr. Denzil Fernandez Sir, for uh, holding this event together and giving the patronship. Uh, thank you everyone. And I would really like to thank uh, all the HR and IR people joining here. Thanks to Nandi ma'am for sharing. And all, uh, I would say, a very good audience who has been here, from especially from XLRI and those who care about human resources, especially for our country. Thank you very much. And we hope to see you in our future episodes of Hashtag Employment Debate. Thank you. And I wish you all a very good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Please take care of yourself.